Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight. We have been working our way through the book of Exodus over the past several months, and we are now in Exodus 32. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible of your own if you can. And if you could join us together tonight in Exodus chapter 32, we'll be there in just a moment. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. As you can see there on the screen, God's people have been freed from their slavery in Egypt. They have crossed over the Red Sea. They have headed out into the wilderness, and they are now assembled around Mount Sinai as God has been giving Moses the law, as well as some instructions for building the tabernacle. And that's where we left it last week. God gave Moses those two tablets written by the finger of God. And as I said a few months ago, Moses becomes the first person to download something from the cloud to a tablet. Sorry to do that to you again, but it just seemed to fit since he got those uh, tablets delivered from God last week. So that's where we left it last week, and we pick up tonight with the first paragraph in Exodus chapter 32. So Exodus 32, and we'll start tonight by looking at verses 1 through 6. Exodus 32, verses 1 through 6. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, let us make a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I want us to notice we are not told in this passage exactly how long it's been since Moses first went up there in the mountain, but it's been a while. We learn elsewhere that it's now been 40 days. Uh, so it's been so long that the people are starting to get nervous. And if we could put ourselves in their situation, they're gathered around this smoking, quaking, thundering mountain. And their leader has said, I'm going to go up here into this smoking, burning, fiery cloud and just wait for me until I get back. And obviously they are concerned. They're worried about this. They are restless. And so they start swarming around Aaron and they have this demand. We don't know what's happened to this Moses guy. And uh, we want you to make us a God to lead us from here. And I just want us to notice at the beginning here, um, they don't have a lot of uh, dedication to Moses, do they? I mean, it's been 40 days. In a sense, that's been a while. But in a sense, it's only been 40 days. And they're willing to leave Moses behind. And so in response, they want Aaron to make them a God to lead them away from this place. What a messed up way of thinking. I know in our minds we may uh, think of these people as being God's chosen people. Certainly they are. And yet in reality, these people really have no clue who God really is. Practically speaking, these people are Egyptians. They're Israelites by birth. They're Israelites by blood, by heritage. But really, they don't know what they believe. They've been in Egypt for 400 years. Egypt has rubbed off on them. So they are now thinking in terms of the Egyptian system. And I think we understand that today the world has a way of rubbing off on us. And that's a constant danger that we face. Well, so also Egypt had rubbed off on them through the years. And so they're thinking in terms of the Egyptian system where they had a God for everything, the God of the sun, the God of the Nile, the God of the crops, and on and on and on. And now they need Aaron to create yet another God, a God who will lead them somewhere. So you know when you create a God... Um, you're making this God not in God's image, but in your own image. So it's the opposite of the way it needs to be. So basically, if we create a God, we're, we're creating a God who will do what we want him to do. And that's what they're looking for here. So they clearly admit that you can make a God. And, and people actually think this way, not just back then, uh, but also today as well. 
Now, as we think about this from a leadership point of view, I think uh, many of us in the world, we have uh, some way that we influence or lead other people, no matter what we do. So as a leader, what should Aaron have done when he's approached by these people? Well, I think in hindsight, it seems to me, first of all, that Aaron should have gone to God in prayer with this thing. That's one of the first things that he should have done. Obviously, looking back on this, uh, we have 2020 hindsight, easy for us to say. Um, but dear Lord, the people are harassing me to make them a God. What should I do? And I think we would understand. I think we would agree that God would have given him an answer to that question. And so he should have prayed first. And that's such a basic thing. And, and we say that. But do we do this? We say Aaron should have done this, but do we do this ourselves? Do we go to God in prayer as we make decisions? Hopefully we do, uh, but it can be so easy to forget that, especially in the heat of the moment. We think, well, I'm prepared for this moment. My experience tells me to do this, and there's a value to that. We understand that, but there's also a huge value in stopping and going to God in prayer. So do we go to God in prayer as we make decisions? I read one article earlier today suggesting a lesson for leaders kind of connected to this. Even though it seems like it, everything's not an emergency that has to be decided on right at this exact moment. And I hope that makes sense. If you've faced uh, a crisis in your leadership in the world, uh, everything that, that comes before you has a way of seeming urgent. And sometimes, though, we just need to slow down. And maybe we need to stop for a moment. We need to consult with our fellow leaders. If you remember back then, Aaron was not the only one in charge, was he? Aaron was left in charge by Moses, but Moses also made sure that he had her, H-U-R, as an assistant. We also assume that he had the other elders of Israel. And so Aaron really should have slowed things down, not made this decision on his own. There is no dishonor in saying, let me think about this for a while. Let me consult with my fellow elders or with my fellow leaders. And uh, as it was, though, Aaron doesn't do this. He just does what he thinks he needs to do to make the problem go away. There's this crisis. He makes the crisis disappear. You want a calf? Sure, let's make a calf. Uh, but obviously that was not good at all. It created a much, much greater problem on down the line. So he should have slowed down. He should have got advice. Beyond this, I think most of us would agree, Aaron should have just said no. Uh, Aaron should have had a spine here. And again, we're not in his position. We aren't the ones who are being surrounded by two to three million people demanding this thing. And we may never know how stressful that must have been being approached by this huge group demanding uh, what they were demanding. And yet, as God's appointed leader, Aaron should have had the guts to say, absolutely not. There is no possible way that I'll be making a God. This is not what we do as God's people. This is nonsense. We need to have faith. We need to wait for Moses. His last words to us were to wait, and we are waiting. And so first of all, Aaron should have slowed down. He should have approached God in prayer. But secondly, he should have just refused this stupid request. This is not what we're doing. Uh, we're not going down this road. Ob obviously, though, however, instead of doing this, notice what Aaron does. He responds to this request. Not only does he allow it, but he says, give me your gold. He caves, and then he personally takes this gold that's collected from the people, and he personally creates a golden calf. And when the people see it, they say, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And by the way, when the kingdom splits in half after the death of King Solomon many years later, it was King Jeroboam who I believe uses these exact words to justify setting up calves to worship in the northern kingdom, one in the north, one in the south of the northern kingdom. And so in a sense, King Jeroboam was quoting the Bible, wasn't he? If he was quoting what Aaron said here, if he was using this as justification, what he was using as justification sounded religious. In fact, it's actually in the Bible. But I hope we notice here that not everything that's in the Bible was meant to be followed. Uh, remember, we have actually have the words of Satan in the Bible, don't we? We have Satan quoted on a number of occasions, but that doesn't mean that we need to do what Satan says to do, even though it's in Scripture. And so we just need to be very careful as we study. And I'm just reminding us that Jeroboam rips this statement out of context completely, and he uses this event as justification for doing the same thing later. And perhaps we, uh, when that happened under Jeroboam, the people were probably thinking, well, yeah, I think I've... 
I think I've read something like that in the Bible somewhere. This sounds familiar. And it was, in fact, scripture, but it was scripture that was completely uh, yanked out of its context. Well, notice Aaron sees how the people react to this. They love it. And I think most of us as leaders probably like it when people love the decisions that we make. Oh, this is a great thing. You're the best leader ever. You've, you've done what we wanted you to do. You've averted this huge crisis. Now we have a God who will lead us and not leave us at this smoking, quaking mountain. And so notice that Aaron then even goes beyond this. And he not only makes this golden calf, but now he makes an altar in front of the calf and he dedicates a day of feasting. And this feasting is to be to the Lord. So I want us to notice that Aaron has now combined the worship of this calf with the worship of the one true God. And the people then have this huge celebration where they sit down to eat and drink. They get up to play. Uh, by the way, that reference to getting up to play goes back to a Hebrew word or kind of a figure of speech that sometimes refers to a celebration with a sexual aspect to it. And I believe we find the exact same word back in Genesis 26, verse 8. Uh, you may remember where King Abimelech uh, watches Isaac caressing his sister Rebekah. And it was the kind of caressing that causes this pagan king to realize that these two really aren't brother and sister after all. At least he hopes that they're not. This is not the kind of caressing the brothers and sisters need to be doing. And so that's the word. So over here now, back in Exodus 32, 6, uh, we have the same word repeated in this context. The NIV communicates the thought behind this maybe a little better by saying that the people got up to indulge in revelry. Um, and so Paul, by the way, will quote this later. In 1 Corinthians 10, 7, to emphasize how God's people have always been tempted to do this kind of thing. And in that context, by the way, Paul even refers to sexual sin that takes place in large groups. So that's what we're talking about here. A, a huge, uh, you know, drinking, party, eating, uh, sexual sin, in some sense, most likely taking place as a group. So this is uh, quite the feast that they're having at the base of Mount Sinai. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 32, verses 7 through 10. Exodus 32 verses 7 through 10. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. So meanwhile, back up on the mountain, God sees what's happening down below, and God is clearly upset. And I hope we notice how God addresses Moses. You need to go and check on your people. Notice in that context, God is not identifying them as his people or God's people. He's saying, Moses, you need to go check on your people. And I don't know about you, that reminds me of like a husband and wife and the wife saying, you know, you need to check on your son, you know, who's doing this terrible thing, kind of, uh, he's yours now. He's, he's yours when he does bad, he's mine when he does good. Uh, I think we're kind of familiar with that. So God seems to be doing something a little bit similar. Moses, go check on your people. So the people have violated the first few commandments even before they have the commandments. And I also want us to notice that they have done this quickly, God says. So they've done this even faster than you might expect. And in response, God tells Moses he's about to kill them all. He's about to start over with Moses. So he's ready to fulfill the promise made to Abraham, not through the nation as a whole, but he's going to start over with Moses. Moses is in the bloodline. We're going to kill all them, and we're going to start over with you. I also want us to notice here uh, one commentary was pointing out, as I was reading it, I think yesterday, that um, it's not as if God was eager to destroy the people, but it's almost as if God is asking Moses to talk him out of it. And I think that changes the tone of this passage just a little bit. Like, they need to be destroyed, but I, I kind of want you to, to talk me out of it as well. And so there is this conflict in God's mind. He wants to save 
but he can't really save because there's unforgiven sin here. And that, that's a conflict that will continue on uh, throughout humanity. So maybe we can just barely start to understand this anger, this frustration. You know, God has rescued the people from Egypt. And now not only are they not thankful, but they have attributed that deliverance to this calf made out of gold. And imagine rescuing somebody, you know, putting your life on the line to to dive into an icy lake to bring somebody back to shore. And instead of thanking you, they thank somebody else who wasn't even there. Is that a little bit frustrating? You know, not that it's a huge deal, but I mean, to, to God, it was a huge deal. He had absolutely saved these people from Egypt, and now they are attributing that salvation to a made-up God that they've made with their own hands. And now notice they are sacrificing to the calf instead of sacrificing to God. And I also want us to notice here that Aaron, in that last previous paragraph, had combined the two. Remember that? So we got the worship of the calf. Now he combined it with this feast or this sacrifice to God. And so I think in Aaron's mind, he was justifying what they were doing by combining the worship of God with the worship of the calf. But I also want us to notice that God very clearly does not see it in this way. To God, they were actually worshiping the calf and they were sacrificing to it. And there's a lesson there for us. When we adulterate or corrupt our worship to God, when we combine it with something else, we don't get partial credit for that. That's not how that works. And so it's important then that we worship God alone. And it's important that we worship as God has instructed, because God has every right to be jealous and angry if we do not do it in the way he has commanded. So he delivered us from sin, and he alone has every right to demand that we worship him as he has commanded. But these people, though, they've completely blown it, and God is ready to start over with Moses. Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 32, verses 11 through 18. Exodus chapter 32, verses 11 through 18. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens. And all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. Starting up in verse 11, Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. To intercede is to speak up and to plead someone else's case in the presence of another. And Moses can do this because Moses has a special relationship with God. Moses is a prophet. He speaks on God's behalf. Moses is the go-between. Moses, in a sense, has, has a foot in each world. He's got a foot in heaven, a foot on earth, in a sense. And as I see this passage, Moses is trying to calm God down a little bit. He's asking God to give the people a second chance. And notice his first big appeal, his first argument of two is that if God destroys the people, this will make God look bad to the Egyptians. And it's an interesting argument, isn't it? Moses is basically arguing that if he destroys the people, God's going to have a PR problem, a public relations problem. Maybe 30 years ago when we lived in Janesville, I remember an elderly man getting arrested for stealing an eight-cent washer from Menards. You know how you might take a bolt into a hardware store to make sure you get the right size and you kind of try on a few? Well, this old guy had apparently done this, and we may never know whether it was intentional or whether it was an oversight on his part, but he walked out with that washer without paying for it. 
and he was arrested and then it hit the news and it looked really bad for Menards. I mean, legally, they had every right to prosecute the man, didn't they? They had every right to do that. He had indeed stolen the merchandise. But it really didn't look good for this huge corporation to go after an old man over an eight-cent washer, did it? And it hit the news, and it was a kind of an embarrassing ordeal. Now, I'm not saying this is completely parallel. It is not. But Moses is making the argument that if God utterly destroys his own people over this, it really won't look good to the Egyptians. And if you remember, God had impressed the Egyptians a little bit, hadn't he? Uh, he had done the plagues, and, and some of them were starting to understand that maybe God is who he said he is. And so Moses is saying, if you destroy them now, you're really going to look bad to the Egyptians. Well, the second argument, starting in verse 13, is this. Remember the promise that you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel. And amazingly, God listens to Moses' arguments here, doesn't he? He relents, and he backs off on completely destroying his people. And this is a powerful reminder. This is how this affects us today. God listens to prayer. And God will often do something that he hadn't planned on doing, or he will not do something that he had planned on doing. He will change course on something, all because someone approaches him in prayer. Otherwise, why pray? God can change what he's doing or will not do based on prayer. Prayer has the power to change God's mind on some things. So with that, Moses then heads down the mountain with these two tablets written on both sides, which is sometimes overlooked. I think we talked about this briefly a week or so ago. The tablets are often pictured as only having writing on the one side. And you got Moses there displaying the Ten Commandments. But uh, in fact, here we find they're written on both sides. But Moses heads down with these tablets written by God himself. And as he rejoins Joshua, if you remember, Joshua, I think, went up partway and then was left behind as uh, Moses went up further onto the mountain. So they rejoin. Uh, he rejoins Joshua. They continue down together. And as they go down, they hear what's going on. You know how when you're hiking to a waterfall, it's all quiet in the woods. And as you get closer, maybe you start to hear something. There, there's something. There's a roar. There's kind of a low hum, perhaps, and you think, ah, oh, I'm getting closer. And the closer you get, kind of that sound clarifies. You start to understand what it is. And so at first, in this case, it sounds like war. There, there's something, they're shouting, there's something going on. But as they get closer, they realize that it's basically a huge party. So they hear singing. There is, uh, you know, loud singing as they get closer to the camp. So let's pick up tonight with Exodus 32, verses 19 through 24. Exodus 32. 19 through 24. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you? that you have brought such great sin upon them. Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Well, in the first half of this passage, Moses makes his way down to the camp, and now he is almost as mad as God is, isn't he? He sees the calf, he sees the dancing, he sees what's going on here, and Moses' anger burns. And I want us to notice he throws the tablets from his hands, and he shatters them on the ground at the foot of the mountain. As I've said before, Moses is the first person to break all Ten Commandments, isn't he? In fact, he literally breaks all the commandments at once. And I hope we can imagine what kind of anger it would take to do this. I put ourselves in that situation. Imagine having God personally give you something written with his own finger. How would you treat that? If God gave me something written with his own finger, I can't think of anything else on this earth that would be more valuable than that. You talk about if your house catches fire, what are you going to run in and grab? You know, this is it. This, this is a, a set of tablets written with the very finger of God. 
Now imagine carrying those, hauling these handwritten tablets down the mountain. You're hiking, you're making your way down rocks and climbing, and you're so careful. And now imagine being mad enough to do something like this, to throw those at the ground, breaking them into little pieces. Moses, therefore, is incredibly angry. He's so angry, in fact, that he grinds the golden calf into a fine powder, and he forces these people to drink it. Now, I want us to note here what kind of man Moses was. What kind of man can force two to three million people to drink powdered gold? Can you imagine that? Moses was not a wimpy man. Uh, Moses was able to get it done here. You know, I think back to the early years of parenting where we tried to make the punishment fit the crime. You know, you read the books on, read the books on child rearing and, you know, sometimes you punish a child and there's no connection. Like, okay, I did this wrong and you're doing this to me. What in the world? And it doesn't make sense. So you try to make the punishment fit the crime. Uh, one time, a certain person in our family at the age of like three uh, took a ball and put it down the furnace exhaust vent. So a little red ball went in the vent dun, 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 all the way down to the furnace, had to call the furnace repair man. And, and so we're like, you can't be putting balls in the pipes on the side of the house. And so, you know, your punishment is for three days or whatever it was, you can't play with any balls. So that, oh, no, this is a terrible thing. Well, you know, it wasn't an awful thing better than other punishments. It kind of, you know, the punishment fit the crime. I think he went over to a neighbor's house and they were playing ball. And he's like, oh, no, I, I can't play with balls. I'm... I'm not allowed. I'm like, what in the world are you doing to your kid? But, you know, we communicated the message. It's, it's a challenge as parents not to be too severe, but to be uh, firm enough, make the punishment fit the crime. Uh, but I think right here is an early example of this. Moses makes the punishment fit the crime in this regard. Um, so you made this golden calf. I'm going to grind it up and make all you people drink it, you know, so you understand not to do this. Uh, and uh, when I think about this, this grinding up gold and drinking, and I think back years ago to Beagle number one in our house. Uh, we've, we're on Beagle number three right now. But I think it was Beagle number one who ate every piece of tinsel off of our Christmas tree when we left her alone for a few hours. Can you picture this? You got a Christmas tree, we covered it with tinsel, basically shredded little metallic strips, and we come home and she has eaten every single strip of tinsel off the tree. Well, let me tell you, she regretted that the next morning. And I'm telling you, we could have cleaned up the yard using a metal detector that spring. So she was not comfortable the next morning. Um, but I'm saying something similar is going on here. When I think of uh, drinking ground up metal, that's just what comes to my mind. But Moses forces them to drink the golden calf. So I, I think a fitting and certainly a memorable punishment. Well, in the second half of this passage, Moses now turns his anger to Aaron. Basically, how could you do such a thing? I delegated, I trusted you with this. How could you do such a thing? And I want us to notice Aaron tries to defend himself, doesn't he? Instead of apologizing, yes, Moses, I'm sorry, I did the thing. Instead of that, he tries to avoid taking responsibility. And I notice, in a sense, he starts by blaming Moses, doesn't he? You know the people, you know this, they're, they're prone to evil. In other words, what did you expect? You put me in charge. You knew they were terrible. And then secondly, the people were concerned that you might not come back. I told them to take off the gold. They gave it to me. I throw it into the fire and I'll pop this calf. Is that what happened? Not exactly. In that previous paragraph up in verse four, we learned that Aaron took the gold from their hand. They didn't even put it in his hand. They brought it to him. He took the gold from their hands. He fashioned it with a graving tool and he made it into a molten calf. That right there took some planning. That took some skill, that took some intent. So the calf certainly did not just pop out of the fire on its own. And so Aaron then tries to avoid taking responsibility for this. Well, let's continue with Exodus 32 verses 25 through 29, the next paragraph. Exodus 32, 25 through 29. Now, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, dedicate yourselves today to the Lord for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. Notice we don't really have a direct response from uh, Moses to Aaron for his failure to properly lead. We just kind of drop that at the end of the last paragraph, and that doesn't really go anywhere. So maybe the initial rebuke was enough. After all, I think even Moses will have his moments over the coming years. Maybe he realizes, yes, this was pretty much an impossible task that I asked my brother to do. Uh, the people truly are stubborn and rebellious. But now Moses sees that the people are completely out of control. It's not improving. He sees even their enemies are laughing or noticing how bad it is. And so something's got to be done. So Moses then stands before the people. He forces them to decide, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And then apparently the Levites step forward and he has the sons of Levi head out with their swords and start killing people. And I'm assuming these are the people who did not come to Moses. So the Levites obey. The Bible tells us that about 3,000 men fall that day. And Moses uses this as a reminder to the people to dedicate themselves fully to the Lord. At first, in my notes on this chapter, I wrote down, I said that they were to rededicate themselves to the Lord. But that's really not necessarily what's going on here, is it? When we think about it, we may realize that many of these people have perhaps never really dedicated themselves to the Lord in the first place. After all, they were enslaved in Egypt. God brings them out. Many are just following the crowd at this point. They aren't dedicated as God's people. A lot of them have never made such a commitment. Nobody's ever really made the decision that I am on the Lord's side. And that's a problem. And that has explained some of their behavior. And so now they have the opportunity to actually choose to follow the Lord. Well, let's conclude tonight with uh, Exodus chapter 32, verses 30 through 35. Exodus chapter 32, verses 30 through 35. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. Well, after the initial punishment, Moses now explains that he's going to approach the Lord to try to make atonement for their sin. So there's like this physical consequence, but then there's also the more important issue of being separated from God. And that's what he does. He goes back up the mountain. He confesses the people's sins to the Lord. He explains what they've done. And then he basically begs for forgiveness. And if God will not do this, Moses asks that his own name be blotted out of God's book. I don't know about you, but that reminds me of something Paul wrote, I think, in the opening verse or two of Romans chapter 9, like uh, where his goal, his prayer was for the salvation of his own people. And I'm just paraphrasing, but Paul said something to the effect, you know, I wish that I myself could be accursed, like I would lose my salvation if it meant that my Jewish brothers and sisters could be saved. And so if God will not do this, if, if God will not forgive, Moses asked that his own name be taken out of God's book. And I think this may be the first reference uh, to this book of names, maybe a reference to the book of life that we read about elsewhere later in scripture. I know in the book of Revelation, it's not explained fully here, but it's almost as if God has this book listing the names of those who are saved. And that's what God explains. Those who continue in sin are going to be removed from his book, but those who remain need to get moving. And so Moses then is commissioned to lead the people out into the wilderness away from Mount Sinai, and Moses is to follow God's angel. This brings us to the end of Exodus 32. Uh, as we wrap it up tonight, I just want to make sure that we don't miss the significance of the number of people who died on this day. As Moses comes down the mountain with God's law, the people are in the process of rebellion, and 3,000 men are killed that day. 
hundreds of years later, uh, just over 1,400 years later, in fact, in Acts chapter 2, when God's new law is preached for the very first time, the people accept the message. 3,000 are baptized on that day, which is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, by the way, was commonly thought to be a celebration of the anniversary of the giving of the first law on Mount Sinai. And if that is true, we then have 3,000 being killed at the giving of the first law and 3,000 being given new life at the giving of the new law on the anniversary of Moses coming down from the mountain with that first law. So I don't know about you, but to, to me, that is just an amazing contrast that I hope we realize. One law brings death in a sense, while the law of Jesus brings life through the gospel. And we see that contrast with 3,000 people dying and 3,000 people being given new life. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions or concerns or comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. You can send me an email, info at fourlengthschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. That means a lot to us. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only great and awesome God, the creator of heaven and earth. We praise you tonight for the law that was first delivered through your servant Moses the prophet. But tonight we're especially thankful for your new covenant, the promise of salvation through Jesus to all who will hear and believe and obey. Sometimes we also have a tendency to wander as your people always have through history. But we're thankful, Father, for your patience and for your love for us. We ask for your forgiveness when we turn away and we pray for your strength to guide us home. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.